Illustrative Math, Algebra 2, Unit 7, Lesson 8 is called Not Always Ideal. Goals today, I can justify a mathematical claim using evidence. I know how to use mathematical evidence to find the difference between when outcomes are unfair or due to random chance. And I understand why it's important to be skeptical of data that seems unfair. All right, our warm up. Lynn, Kieran, and Diego are going to shoot 100 free throws each for practice. Based on their shooting in the past, Lynn thinks that they are all of similar ability, and Lynn estimates that they each have a 60% chance of making each shot. They, shoot, they each shoot their shots. Lynn makes 63 of 100, Kieran makes 75 of 100, and Diego makes 35 of 100. From the results, do you agree with Lynn's estimate for the chance of each person, person making each shot? Explain your reasoning. Okay, so you could have went either way here. Um, so if you said yes, I put a possible yes response here. Um, so if you agree with, with Lynn, um, you know, Lynn was pretty close to his estimate, and Kieran might have been having a good day, and Diego might have been having a bad day. So um, that is possible. Um, it's also possible to say no um, as long as you back it up. And, and Lynn, you know, if you said no, you could say Lynn was accurate in his estimate for himself. However, it's obvious that Kieran shoots better than 60% and Diego shoots worse. So his estimates were off. For them, were off. Okay? So either way, as long as you, you back it up with, with a reason there. All right. Uh, the first activity. What is the probability that you would flip heads when using the coin in the applet? So the applet would be, if we were in class, I have this, like, app that I would just, rather than actually physically flipping a coin... I would just press a button and it would randomly generate a heads or a tails. So obviously um, everybody should know there are two sides on a coin. So flipping heads, you'd have one favorable chance out of two total sides. So when you flip it 20 times, in theory, you should get 10 heads and 10 tails. Now that doesn't always happen, but 10 would be probably your your measure of central tendency. It would be you know, if I did it, you know, if I did a bunch of different trials, 10 would probably be the most common number. Sometimes I might get 11, sometimes I might get 9 um, if I flip it 20 times, but but 10 would be what I would, would be my estimate. All right, so flip your coin 20 times and record the number of heads you get. Repeat this process four more times, and then um, create a dot plot that shows the number of heads in 20 flips using data from the class. So what I did was I already went ahead and did it, so, you know, like the first four would be my four, and then the next ones would be like ones from other people in the class. So, so here's all my totals here. So I'm going to do a dot plot. So let's start with the lowest number, which is seven, and I only have one seven. So I guess I need, I didn't put seven on my, I didn't put seven on my table here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to put one dot. At seven. And then I go to eight. How many eights do I have? How many times did he flip eight heads? So one, two, two eights. So I put two dots there. And then I'll go to nine. I have one, two, three nines. How many tens do I have? One, two, three, four, five. Five tens. Okay, and then I go to 11. One, two. I only have two 11s. And then do I have any 12s? I have one 12 here on this. No, I have two 12s on this 13th and 15th trial. Okay, so. I should have 15 total dots. Let me count them up here. Five, six, 11. Cool, I do have 15. So there's my, my dot plot, okay? So what's the fewest number of heads flipped by the class in 20 flips? What's the greatest number? So I'll go, whoops, go back here. I think it was seven was the fewest and 12 was the greatest. Based on the dot plot, describe a range of values that represent a reasonable number of heads to flip when flipping 20 times. So based off of my data, or our class's data, I would say 
7 to 12. But obviously, if we had a bigger class, instead of that class only had 15 total flips, um, you know, it would definitely be more likely that you could get out of that range. It might be more, more along the lines of like 4 to, you know, 17. You might, you know, it, it just depends how many, um, how big your class is. So, so this will vary. All right, number seven, Priya flips her coin 20 times and it lands on head twice. Is it possible for this to happen with a fair coin? Yes, but it's extremely unlikely um, to only have two heads out of 20 flips when it's basically a 50-50 chance. Very, very unlikely that that would happen, but it's possible. Based on the class distribution, should she be suspicious of this being an unfair coin? What can she do to provide evidence that it's not a fair coin? So yes, she should be suspicious of it being an unfair coin. She should repeat the trial a few more times by doing a couple rounds of flipping, of flipping it 20 more times to see if it is closer to 10, okay? So that will tell you if it was just a bad trial um, or, or what, um, you know, if, if she keeps getting numbers closer to two, I would definitely suspect that the coin is weighted or, or something. All right, next thing. The local news station wants to interview eight students from a school. There are 25 students on the student council. 10 of the students are from the graduate class and 15 are from other, the other classes. The principal has a difficult time deciding which students from the council will get interviewed, so she tells the group of students that she will put all of the names in a bowl, mix the names, then the first eight names who are selected from the bowl will get to be interviewed. The next day, the principal returns with the names selected. Turns out five of the students who get to be interviewed are in the graduating class, and only three of the students selected are from other classes. The students who are not in the graduating class complain that this doesn't seem fair. They suspect that the principal chose the group rather than selecting at random. So let's kind of write this down because it's kind of confusing in, in the paragraph form. 15 are from other classes, 10 are from graduating. So 10 graduating class, 15 are from other classes. So when she chose it, she had five from graduating class out of the eight. So really 50% of, of, the, of the kids are from that graduating class, which is kind of a high number considering it's less than half of the total. It's, it's 40%. And then three from other classes. All right, so do you think the principal could have chosen this group of students at random like she promised to explain your reasoning? So it may be possible, but it seems unlikely. Um, there are a lot more applicants who are not in the graduating class, but more than half ended up being from that class. So it seems like it might not be fair. Okay, because obviously, you know, you should be more like, you know, if I only have 10 out of 25, it should be point. Four, let's see what that would be. 10 out of 25 is 0.4 times um, let's see here. We should times that by she's choosing 8. So if I multiply those, what do I get? End up with 3.2. So it's a little high. Okay. So you should, this number should be closer to 3.2. Now, again, it could be a little high, it could be a little low. Um, and this number is, is definitely uh, way off because if I did 15 out of 25 times 8, that should be 4.8. Okay, so this one's a little high, this one's a little low, obviously, compared to what they should be proportionally. All right. Simulate the drawing many times to find some possible results. Cut a piece of paper into 25 equal size pieces. On 10 of the pieces of paper, write graduating cl class. And on the other 15 pieces of paper, write other classes. Fold the papers in half and mix them up. All right. Um, 
and then you'll take turns with your partner to each draw eight and record the number of students chosen that are in the graduating class. Repeat this process four more times. So I went ahead and, and just simulated it here. I wrote, out, I did it a bunch of times myself and I, I wrote them out. <clears throat> so um, I end up having 25 different trials, okay? Create a dot plot that shows the number of students chosen from the graduating class by all the students in your class. Okay, so here's my dot plot. So let's draw this out here. So zero. I have one with zero. Oops, hold on. Let me make that a little bit bigger dot. All right, and then at one, I have, let's count them up here, one, I have one, two. And then two, I have one, two, two twos. And then three, I have one, two, three threes. I have one, two, three, four, five, five fours. One, two, three, four, five, fives. Sixes. I have one, two, three, sixes. Seven. I have one. Two, two sevens, and I think I have an eight. Is there a nine in there? Not a nine. Okay. So let me count my dots, make sure I have 25. One, two, three, four, five, eight, 18. I'm missing one. Which one am I missing? Oh, no. Um, let's double check here. Eights, I have one eight, two sevens, three sixes, one, two, three, four, five fives, one, two, three, four, five, fours. Up oh, there it is. I'm missing a three. There we go. All right. There's my dot plot. All right. So there's my dot plot. Let's go to number four. Based on the dot plot, do you think it's reasonable that the principal selected the students for the interview at random and still chose five of the eight students who are in the graduating class? Explain your reasoning. All right. Well, it's not unreasonable. As we look at this from the dot, dot plot, we can see that there are a lot of trials in our dot plot that had five or greater. Okay. So that it is possible. Okay, um, obviously when we go back and look at that, we said that 3.2 would be kind of like in the middle here. So 3.2, so this is a little bit heavier above it, but 3.2 would be more like your mean. So this may be not quite a normal distribution, but um, but yeah, still kind of looks like a bell curve somewhat, but looks like my mean is more up here. It should be more like closer to, to the three. All right. Um, lesson synthesis. What was the purpose of actually flipping the coins and actually selecting the pieces of paper? This allowed us to get data to estimate how likely it was that a particular outcome would happen. What did the results of the simulations help you to understand? The results helped us understand that there can be a great deal of variability when an entire class flips a coin or selects the pieces of paper. That variability helped me to determine how likely it was to get a certain number of heads or a certain number of students from the teacher's class. How does this lesson relate to the concepts of measures of center and variability? Um, since we collected data, we could have found measures of center and variability and used those to create a model like the normal curve. Why is using dot plot with the data from the entire class more useful than using just your own data? 
Um, the larger the sample size means there is more information to provide more confidence in what to expect for a probability. Obviously, the bigger your sample space, the better your data is. Do you think that you would have come to different conclusions if we made the dot plot using data from an even larger group, like multiple schools? It's possible, but it is more likely that we would just have additional evidence for the conclusions we made from the class data. All right, so back to our goals. Let's see if, if we've met them. I can justify a mathematical claim using evidence. I know how to use mathematical evidence to find the difference between when outcomes are unfair or due to random chance. And the last one was, I understand why it's important to be skeptical of data that seems unfair. Okay. And our cooldown. You and some friends are playing in a game in which each person rolls a standard number cube they brought. One of your friends seems to be rolling six a lot. Your friend rolled 20 times and got a six on eight of the rolls. Describe how you could collect data to determine if your friend might be using number cubes that are not fair. Use a fair number cube and roll it 20 times and see if six occurs at least eight times. Repeat that process many times and determine the proportion of trials that had at least eight sixes. Okay, so um, it's possible, but not very likely. And honestly, the odds of rolling a six is one out of six. So if I did one six times 20, you know, whoops, that's still, I gotta make that a little smaller. If I did one six times 20, okay, you would really get like 3.33. Okay, so 3.3 would be the amount that you would expect. That'd be like your, your mean. So you might get a few less, you might get a few more. But um, it's, it's kind of a lot. So you'd have to do a bunch of trials and see, see how likely it is to happen. All right. All right. Thanks for watching this video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And we'll see you next time.